welcome to Broken Entertainment, and there is this very interesting re- interview on uh, Vanity Fair with the with Chris Terrio, the writer of both Batman vs Superman and the Snyder Cut version of the Justice League. Although his name is also on the Whedon Cut, but we'll get into that where he he basically doesn't want it on there. Um, it's a really interesting look at how Warner Brothers has just totally screwed the pooch on this whole DC Cinematic Universe thing and how they continue to do the same things. Like, we'll take a look at some rumors about the next Justice League movie and they're still doing all this stuff. They, they haven't learned at all. And it's really interesting because, yes... Of course, you can expect Chris Terrio to kind of try to deflect some of the blame onto the studio, but with everything we've heard from Ray Fisher, from uh, Zack Snyder, from all these people who are involved in the production of these two movies, I think it's pretty damning and pretty clear that Warner Brothers is just constantly fiddling with this crap instead of letting people make the damn movie. But let's go ahead and get into it here. Alright, so first question, Zack Snyder's Justice League is now out in the world. How do you feel about it? I am so happy and relieved that all the thousands of artists and craftspeople all over the world finally can have their work seen by the public, and all the work that Zack and actors put into this can now be seen. Sort of a gift that we got from HBO Max, because it wouldn't have been possible a few years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you point at something specific that you're glad gets a showcase in the new version? Willem, Willem Dafoe's performance in the Aquaman story. Obviously the character Iris West, played by Kiersey Clemens in the Flash Rescue sequence, and most centrally, Ray Fisher's performance as Cyborg. This is always the heart of the film to me, and just meant so much to me personally because so much of my heart and life were put into that story. That is the thing about this version of Justice League, None of it was done cynically or as a money grab or an attempt to sell Happy Meal toys. It really was personal to me and for Zack Snyder and for many of the actors. And you can see that in the passion they had trying to get the Snyder Cup put out there. And in the passion they had in even reshooting stuff and having additional scenes. This is stuff they weren't paid for. The loyalty that Zack Snyder got out of all these actors is really impressive and you know to me terry is absolutely right ray fisher's cyborg is if not the heart of the movie he's certainly part of it and when they took that out that movie lost a lot and it certainly it crippled the cyborg character you know in the whedon cut it was like all right so here's this random biomechanical guy, I guess. You know, there, there was nothing to him. Is it true you were banned from the Justice League set? I wouldn't say I was banned. The studio attitude was, we'll take it from here. I was frankly shocked when I saw the Snyder Cut and saw how much of the original script was shot. With some small revisions, they shot the script, and I understand that sometimes it was a battle for Zack. How did you feel about the version Joss Whedon assembled after Zack left the project? When those personal touches were removed from the film in the 2017 version, I was silent because I couldn't really say anything. But of course it hurt. All that remained was a dinosaur skeleton of what had been a great lumbering beast, might have been a big unruly beast, and obviously it's four hours, and the movie is maximalist, and it's operatic, and sure it's a little crazy, but I think the movie is crazy in the best way. So do I, personally. Can we start at the beginning with Zack? You worked on Batman vs. Superman. Can I assume that was a good experience, at least with him, since you signed on to another movie? So this this is really interesting to me because I, this is something I had no idea about. Ben Affleck called me and said that he was working on this film, which was a Superman film in which he was going to play Batman. So he asked if I would read the script and consider doing a rewrite. He asked if I would do some character work, so it was already determined and storyboarded that Batman was going to try to be killing Superman, and that Batman was going to have gone down a dark road. He was branding criminals. It has certain dark elements that were non-negotiable already in the story. 
It's very interesting to me that Ben Affleck took the script and he reached out to a writer who was known for his character writing and said, hey, can you come in and put your touch on this and do, do some rewrites and get the characters really nailed down. Ben Affleck wasn't just another actor playing Batman. He was deeply interested in this role and it's tragic and terrible how all this played out. What did Affleck want you to do? My job was to create a story and a tone, really, in which Batman could be that person, in which two heroes could get to the point where they're fighting to the death. What was your approach? I came into it thinking the only way that this could work is a f as a fever dream or as a revenge tragedy. I thought, how do we create a story in which Bruce Wayne is traumatized by the War of Krypton coming to Earth, in which he enters into this kind of madness? He becomes Captain Ahab, and he won't listen to saner voices like Alfred, for example, who are telling him just to see reason. He's a man possessed. So the film was dark by its nature. As I worked on the movie, it seemed to me that it was a snapshot of what I was feeling on the ground in the country, which maybe didn't become apparent until the madness and division that came about from the last presidency. I thought this superhero movie could be, ab could be about getting into our worst nightmares, but then coming out of that into a redemption. And it's thing you don't really see until you see the Snyder Cut, right? And Batman is this changed guy. He's talking about faith. He's talking about hope. He's not killing people other than the parademons. That doesn't really count. And yes, he goes into the usual political tripe that everybody in Hollywood, you know, oh, our modern day, woe is me. You know, come on. What did you want to avoid? I didn't want to make it into a sitcom joke that Batman and Superman are trying to kill each other. If I'm going to, to work on this movie, it's going to be dark and operatic. It's going to be uncomfortable. Zach and I come from very different approaches to filmmaking, but I immediately liked him because he isn't cynical. He wears his heart on his sleeve, and I'm cynical enough for any room that I enter into. So this is a problem that a lot of people had with these movies. And it's okay. It's a totally understandable problem. They're very dark. They are uncomfortable at times. They're not the way you're used to seeing these characters. I think when you look at the storyboards for the next Justice League movies that would have come out, when you look at how this whole arc was meant to play out, you see it go from dark and cynical to what you expect the characters to be. And I think it was a very brave take to do. I'm not sure that I would have done it myself. I actually, I know I wouldn't have done it, but it's a brave take. It's a vision that they had. It's not just a like disregard for the characters, for the, the lore, you know, Zack Snyder makes a lot of references. He knows a lot about the background of these characters. It's not someone blindly reinventing. It's someone who says, okay, I want to take this, in a different direction where essentially he wants to earn the optimism by pushing them through darkness. So it's it's like a it's it's like that traditional journey in stories where it goes from high to low to high except that it just starts out low. And there was a certain danger to that, but it, it obviously has its fans. I mean, you have a lot of Snyder Cup fans, myself included, who are willing to let things go that maybe normally they wouldn't in terms of how the characters are treated because they like the way it's going, because they, they can see where it's going. So, and the fact that the characters are really respected. Superman is treated very well. Batman is treated very well. Wonder Woman is awesome. You know, in, in the Snyder Cut, all these characters are done right, even though they're darker versions of what we normally expect. Okay, so then, how did it develop from there? I wrote drafts of the Batman Superman movie, which wasn't called Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice by me. That's interesting. I did not name the script. In fact, I found out what the movie was called along with the rest of the world on the internet. I was not consulted on the title of the film, and I was as surprised as anyone. I would not have named it Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. Was that Zach's choice? I don't know exactly who named it, but I suspect it was a studio, and I suspect it was marketing. Yeah, definitely. 
Might have been the first step towards creating ill will for the film. I suspect putting the words Batman and Superman into the title had some marketing component to it. Yeah. I think you're right. The title did rub people the wrong way. Um, okay, moving on. How did you feel about the version of Batman vs. Superman that was first released? I was proud of the script when I completed it, but it turns out that when you remove the 30 minutes that give the characters motivation for the climax, the film doesn't work. What a shock! As we learned from the two versions of Justice League, you can't skip on the character and think the audience will give a shit about the VFX. Absolutely. And this is part of that meddling I've talked about, where the studio just goes in and they're like, no, 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 cut that out, cut this out, cut that out. We don't need that. Cut this down to two hours. We want this down to under two hours. We want this. Sometimes you have to just let your movie creators make a damn movie. And if it's a little long, it's a little long. A little long has worked, okay? You you can say all you want that three hours is long for a movie, but it's worked in the past on some very popular movies. Titanic, as an example. Dances with Wolves, as another example. That has worked. You know, whether or not you like Titanic isn't part of it, but or Dances with Wolves. But they're very popular movies. They've done very well. You can write that kind of movie as long as it earns it. And when you're talking about 30 minutes, it's 30 freaking minutes. People can sit down for 30 more minutes. Okay? I think it's incredible how much the studio has, has fidgeted with these movies. And you'll see it more as we go. Uh, this stuff was later restored in the extended version. I haven't seen that yet. I want to see it. It's called the Ultimate Edition. It's on uh, HBO Max. In it's already out. So this house of cards have been built in order to motivate this clash between America's two favorite heroes. Made no sense at all. That was what happened with Batman vs Superman. The movie was always going to be dark. There was always going to be people who just didn't want to see that version of a comic book world, and I get that, but what hurt was the criticism that the script was not coherent, because when I turned in the script to the studio, which they by all accounts were happy with, it made sense. So this guy writes this script, and they're like, yeah, great. And then later they're like, oh, let's just remove 30 minutes from the movie. And you can make an argument that you can remove chunks of movies like that, but you got to remove the right chunks of the movie. It it's like they were like a surgeon, and they're like, okay, we gotta we gotta cut out an organ here. Uh, what about that one pumping all the blood? Let's take that out. You know, it it, it just doesn't work. Oh, uh, what was your relationship with Zach? Good. I have nothing whatsoever bad to say about Zach. He has a skill set I don't have as a visualist. He has a contagious excitement when you describe a scene. He almost can't contain himself and just wants to go draw it or paint it. This is what I love about Zack Snyder. Even though I don't like all of his movies, I don't always like his approach. But the fact that it's always a passionate thing for him. He's not just making these movies to make some money. He cares about the characters. He cares about the background. And you see that in everything that he does. After Batman vs. Superman, many of my Hollywood friends just stopped talking to me because they sort of thought that somehow I was complicit in this public failure of a studio film. You learn pretty quickly who your real friends are and who your air kiss Hollywood friends are. Yeah, Hollywood's full of horrible people, is the way I'll put it. That could not have been more supportive and never stopped believing that together we were going to create this big epic DC world. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple things here. Do you feel that the title and the cuts for length made it harder for people to appreciate things that did work? That's exactly right. The audience has to know that they're in good hands. The minute you lose them from a story point of view, they lose the desire to look at it generously. Once the critics decide a movie is incoherent, it's just a pile-on. Then they attack everything. There's a line at the beginning of the film where a warlord says to Lois Lane, They didn't tell me the interview was with a lady. Lois replies, I'm not a lady, I'm a journalist. So one reviewer held this up, held up this line as proof positive of my stupidity and inability to write Lois or to write at all. Well, the character of Lois in the movie was inspired by the journal journalist Mary Colvin, 
who was, of course, killed in Syria. She was one of the most intrepid journalists who ever lived, in my opinion. And there's a story in Vanity Fair, Mary Colvin's Private War, and the line that Lois says is almost exactly the line that was in the article where a Chechen warlord said he wouldn't shake her hand because she was a woman. Mary Colvin replied, there's no woman in this room, only a journalist. So that line was my tribute to her. But then the pile on, a line that is held as proof positive that I don't understand either women or journalists or human beings, and that I'm a shitty writer. I didn't know about any of that. You know, I'm familiar with the Martha thing, but I didn't know people were picking at that one. Sounds like you feel you lost people before they even saw it. That was the climate in which the film dropped. Anything and everything was attacked because the reviewers questioned the movies, but the motives behind the film, and to some extent, I don't blame them. The marketing promises mindless fight movie, and any attempt to make something real or complicated was just met with anger and vitriol because the audience didn't assume good intentions. Interesting. Another complaint was that Snyder's DC films were too grim and heavy. Studios seemed to take this position after Batman vs. Superman that my writing was too dark, and that was their problem. What they didn't mention was that, for example, in the draft of the Batman vs. Superman script that Warner Brothers had developed, which was a draft... This is very important. The draft I was handed when I joined the project, Batman was not only branding criminals with a bat brand, he also ended the movie by branding Lex Luthor. That ending was the point over which I explicitly went to the mat with the studio again and again. I argued Batman cannot end the movie continuing this behavior, which amounted to torture, because then the movie was endorsing what he did. People call out Zack Snyder for this. People call out Chris Terrio for this, and it was the studio. Okay? That's very interesting to me. And shows just how much the studio is just throwing anyone and everyone under the bus. And they're just throwing crap at a wall and hoping that it sticks. Well, what else did you push back against? I'm the one who's been saying we can't make a joke out of Superman raining hell on black African Muslim characters in the desert. Slow's promises Superman is not going to go easy on them because they punched her. But somehow, somehow I'm the person with the dark sensibility. You see, uh, I don't know. That whole scene still has issues. Uh, did you feel you were able to significantly change that Africa scene with Superman for the better? I removed the punch of Lois for one thing. Just think about the optics of that. I was able to add material to the film and ask the movie to grapple with what that battle meant so that it didn't seem like a casual scene of Superman intervening in this way without reckoning with the consequences of intervention. I place that in context of a moral question. Superman says, think of what could have happened, and Lois says, think of what did. That sequence takes place in a fictional African country, and there's manipulation happening with Lex Luthor and his American mercenaries trying to provoke conflict and frame Superman. After Superman rescues Lois, the film shows the people of that region truly suffering in the crossfire. Without, without sounding too politically, yeah, you wouldn't want that to happen. It's not lost to me that much. Like a drone, Superman sort of comes out of nowhere from the sky and vanquishes his enemies and flies off with no consequences. It may not have been an angle on Superman that people wanted to see and wanted to think about. I'm going to skip some more stuff here. Uh, this is a very interesting interview. You should really check it out, but I don't want to just go line for line. Okay, so Zack Snyder shot your version of the script. What happened after his family crisis led him to leave the project and Warner Brothers brought in Joss Whedon? When the movie was taken away, that felt like it was some directive that had come from people who are neither filmmakers nor film friendly. The directive to make the movie under two hours, regardless of what the movie needed to do, and to make the colors brighter and to have funny sitcom jokes. They just screw with everything, and they don't understand why their movies don't work. Corporate production movies do not work. Zach told me it was then Warner Brothers chairman uh, Kevin Sujihara's mandate that it be under two hours and more comedic. They just determined that it was going to be Batman and Superman, and then Wonder Woman, and then Justice League, and then Aquaman. So there was never any thought to how the world was constructed before they issued this edict they said conformed to the schedule. I think it speaks for itself. Studio co-presidents co John Berg and Jeff Johns were on the Justice League set every day. 
which was a mandate from Sujihara to babysit Snyder, as he put it. What is your relationship with him? I admire Jeff as a writer of DC Comics. He's been nice to me and it's been a perfectly cordial relationship. As an executive, you get into very thorny territory when you have a person who's a writer also making executive decisions, sitting in the chair when on other films. And that has shown through so clearly. When you have Jeff Johns as one of the two writers on Wonder Woman 84, look what you got. I think it's miraculous that Zack shot as much of my script as he did because I know that there were constant pressures to simplify, to change, do whatever it is the studio wanted because they were rumbling they didn't want this version. Uh, when did you watch this version of the Justice League? I was in LA at the time working on Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. I was on the west side of Los Angeles working with J.J. Abrams at the time and I drove to the studio, sat down and watched it a couple weeks before release. I immediately called my lawyer and said, I want to take my name off this film. He ends up not doing it, but... It wasn't his movie. It wasn't Zack Snyder's movie. Batman vs. Superman, they cripple with a cut of like all the most important parts of the movie. And they just constantly interject random crap into these movies. And it's like, look, if you're going to hire somebody to make a movie, let them make the damn movie. Okay? And if you don't like what they're doing, fire them and get somebody else. But this, this half-assed going in there and meddling with their shit? You know, come on. Get new writers. Delay the movie. Rework it. Do, the stuff they do obviously didn't work. And they're still throwing crap at the wall. Like, do you have any belief that they're going to stop? I mean, if you look at this rumor about the DCU Justice League, they're going to pull in random characters from all over the damn place. Where they're going to bring in characters from different worlds and different universes. And I'm like, stop. I don't want to watch a Justice League movie that has Calvin Ellis as Superman. I want to watch Clark Kent. It's the only Superman I care about. I don't want Mera in the Justice League. I don't care about the character. I don't want a bunch of race and gender swapped heroes in there for the sake of it. You know, this is the studio just meddling more. Just, oh, we got to change this. We got to have, we got to match the agenda. We got to match the politics. Just make a damn movie. You know what works? Entertainment. You know why it works? You know how we know entertainment works? Godzilla vs. Kong is rolling around in money. And why? Is it a great movie? No, it's not. But it doesn't do politics, it doesn't do agenda, it doesn't do woke crap, and it doesn't do studio meddling. It's a giant lizard punching a giant monkey. People just want to be entertained. Stop with the crap, please. Warner Brothers, you, you just keep going deeper into the stuff they're, they've put all the blame on Zack Snyder and Chris Terrio. And they're like, well, it's all their fault. And Joss Whedon. All their fault. Well, no, you're the ones that made this happen. You're the ones that manipulated everything, screwed everything up, edited everything post-production, and this is what you got. You got what you deserved, and you're going to head deeper into that direction. You hired J.J. Abrams and... Tanahisi Coates, who is a petty, vindictive, horrible person who doesn't have any experience writing movies, try a Superman movie. And you pick the Superman the version of Superman that was literally based on Barack Obama, and you don't understand what you're doing. This is all politics. It's all agenda now. And it's all going to be constant studio meddling. J.J. Abrams lets studio do whatever the hell they want. I mean, look at Rise of Skywalker. What a mess. So I thought this interview was very revealing that here you have this writer of both of these movies who's saying, no, the, neither one of these movies are what we made. And it was constant studio intervention. Constantly. Oh, we'll change this, change this, change this, change this, do this, do that. Oh, we want it lighter. Yeah, we're going to have 
Batman brand Lex Luthor at the end of the movie. Well, we want a lighter. Color, lights, shiny. But it's, it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. Because now the studio has no one who will stand up to them. Zack Snyder stood up to them somewhat. But now it's going to be all sycophants. Let me know what you think about the future of the DCEU. I don't, I don't have faith in it, personally. Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit the like button. If you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing. Hit the bell for notifications, and I will see you next time.